The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Former Georgia beauty queen and beloved high school teacher Tara Grinstead vanished in 2005, leaving a community stunned and without answers for over a decade until Ryan Duke, a former student at the school that she taught at, was arrested and charged with her murder. Just weeks later, Ryan's friend Bo Dukes was also arrested in connection to her disappearance. Both men claimed that they helped dispose of her body, but blamed each other for the murder. When Ryan Duke stood trial, it would be up to a jury to figure out who was telling the truth. I'm Vinnie Politan, and on this week's Court TV podcast, we're diving deeper into this cold case that drew national attention with an audio edition of our original series, Accomplice to Murder. Have a listen. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinny Politan. I'm traveling today to Osceola, a small town in rural Georgia known for its sweet potato festival, southern hospitality, and the mysterious disappearance of a teacher and former beauty queen named Tara Grinstead, who vanished from here nearly two decades ago. Tara was a teacher at the local school, and she was a former beauty queen, a very popular person. On October 22nd, 2005, Tara Grinstead began her day doing one of the things she loved most. It was late October, Saturday. It's a big time around Irwin County because the Sweet Potato Festival, the big event of the year down there, is just coming up. She spent that morning prepping other high school girls for the beauty pageants that were coming up. A lot of them were students of hers, and she helped them get ready and uh, before they all went to the pageant itself. And uh, she was a judge there, also helping people get ready. And uh, that ended around 6 o'clock. She apparently went to a barbecue that was being held in the area, spent some time there. She left the barbecue at around 11 p.m. that evening. It would be the last time that Tara Grinstead was ever seen alive. When Tara didn't show up for school on Monday, local police came here to her house to investigate. Law enforcement would describe the the scene inside Tara's home as ambiguous. Uh, There was no sign of her, but there was a lot of other signs of things that maybe were amiss, maybe weren't. Her cell phone was charging, her purse was there, her car was in the park, it was in her driveway. As the days passed, concerns grew for Tara's safety. This is a town that felt a little insulated, like nothing could happen here, that somebody from the outside had to come in. Something bad has happened. And they combed out across three or four counties uh, looking for any signs, any clues of what might have happened to her. But the landscape surrounding Osceola wouldn't make that easy. As you drive out of Osceola, where Tara lived, pretty much flat farmland, um, pecan trees, uh, groves uh, pretty much all through there, um, large farms of pecan trees, um, and they need water. There's irrigation ponds, there's creeks and stuff like that. Hundreds of volunteers spent weeks looking for Tara in these pine forests and in the nearby pecan orchards, lakes, and swamps of Irwin County, but they found nothing. Tara's disappearance soon made national headlines. It was picked up fairly quickly by the national media. These type of stories were hot at that point. Um, And you got rural South Georgia, a beauty queen, um, big mystery. Nobody knew what was happening. Tara's relationships with men, you know, became a source of interest and, uh, you know, fascination uh, among the small town gossip, you know, rumor mill, but also national tabloids and headlines. The only other physical clue that police had was a latex glove found outside of Tara's house. At the time, nobody knew how important a simple glove uh, could be to this case. It was inside out and laying in the grass. They found that fairly quickly um, and ran tests on it 
which back then came back inconclusive. And then, slowly, the investigation dropped out of the public eye. And it did. Over the course of a few months, it quickly became a cold case. Months passed, then years. And in 2010, Tara Grinstead was declared dead. It seemed like her fate would remain forever hidden amongst the many ponds, pine forests, and pecan orchards of Irwin County. And then seemingly out of nowhere, this kind of small time podcast producer um, who has ties, family ties to Irwin County uh, came out with this podcast uh, up and vanished. Tara Grinstead was a 30 year old former beauty queen and local high school teacher. And season one for several episodes focused on the Tara Grinstead case. Coming up, a first time podcaster from Atlanta comes here to Osceola to shake up an investigation that had been stalled for over a decade. It seemed like I'd poked the hornet's nest and really it never cooled off from that point. The investigation into the disappearance of Tara Grinstead had gone cold since 2005 when she vanished. But then in 2016, an enterprising filmmaker turned podcaster came into town kicking off a series of events that would accomplish in a year what investigators failed to do in over a decade. Tara's disappearance came back into the public uh, discourse through this podcast, uh, Up and Vanished, which was hosted by a young man named Payne Lindsay who had family ties to uh, Irwin County. I knew that finding Tara's body would finally make her murder a reality. I definitely got the vibe right away that I was an outsider. I felt like the City Slicker podcast kid immediately, and no one even knew who I was. Payne was initially concerned no one would want to talk. And so I just started making some cold phone calls to random acquaintances of Tara's and people who were kind of loosely affiliated with the case and Tara herself. And I found pretty quickly that a lot of people were very receptive to me and they were willing to talk. They're never going to find her because she's, she's in some I swamp. remember the night that and she the GBI went guy in. had to come meet with him. The podcast quickly the became the talk of the town. In the first couple of weeks of airing the show, it was only locals who were listening. Like any of the phone calls before they say some, call some it. Guy from Perry. But some it turned from Perry. into almost all the locals listening. And that was really shocking to me at the time that they were paying attention to this random podcast that I was creating. One local from the nearby town of Fitzgerald was one of those listening and following Payne's investigation on the up and vanished message boards. One person who was also watching these message boards pretty closely was uh, Bo Dukes, who was another uh, Irwin County resident who uh, also had, uh, you know, loose ties to uh, uh, Irwin County High School in Tara Grinstead. He grew up around Irwin County, had gone off military and other things. He was living nearby in another town. One evening, he confesses to his girlfriend, Brooke Sheridan, that he knows what happened to Tara Grinstead. He says his friend, Ryan Duke, um, committed the murder, trying to get money out of the house in a burglary, and that he didn't know anything about it until a day later when his friend told him, this is what I've done, I need some help. Brooke Sheridan then calls law enforcement and tells them what Bo Dukes told her. Authorities quickly call in Bo Dukes, get him on video, and he lays out the story. He tells them his version of what happened. He basically tells them that uh, Ryan Duke broke into Tara Grinstead's home looking for drug money, uh, got into an altercation with her, and ended up uh, strangling and uh, killing her. He frames himself as the accomplice. Bo insists all he did was help move the body to a different location in his uncle's pecan orchard, and they stood there and watched over the flames for hours, making sure her body was not visible or recognizable again. The police then call in Ryan Duke for questioning. Less than a half hour of walking in that police station, he was spilling his guts. You hit her and she fell, and you think that at that point she was probably gone. In his version of events, 
Ryan said he used a credit card to break into Tara's apartment to steal money. I was stealing from a purse, and she snuck up on me. I hit her. I didn't mean to. Purely reactionary. He then took investigators to what he said was Tara Grinstead's final resting place. Ryan Duke led investigators to a pine grove next to the pecan orchard behind me as he tried to find the place he said he and Bo Dukes had burned Tara Grinstead's body. Based on his confession, police charged Ryan Duke with the murder of Tara Grinstead. I got an email from one of my friends who works at a local news station, and she said, hey, did you hear about this potential press conference with the GBI at the Ocilla Courthouse today? I was like, about what? Tara Grinstead case. I'm like, no way. With the murder of Tara Grinstead, Duke was taken into custody yesterday afternoon, and a warrant was issued. People were shocked. And it almost scared them more than it being a boogeyman. There was somebody right from their own hometown. But Ryan Duke's name had never been mentioned in connection with the investigation. People wanted to know, who's Ryan Duke? At that point, Ryan Duke, to a lot of people, is kind of a mystery. They kind of remember him from high school. Um, he and Bo hung out a lot together. In the intervening years, his life had kind of fallen apart. He, drugs, alcohol. Um, he had had kind of a rough life. He was back at home, outside, living with his mother. Within a few days, Bo Dukes was arrested, uh, specifically in a nearby county, and uh, charged with his part, what he had admitted to doing as part of the cover-up. Bo Dukes. Now, that was a name the locals recognized. Bo Dukes comes from a prominent family in Irwin County. They own a large uh, pecan grove and other uh, farmland uh, that uh, produces a lot of uh, outlay in the area. Bo Dukes had gone off, joined the military, been stationed at one point uh, nearby, not too far away in Savannah, uh, got into trouble uh, stealing from authority stealing from the U.S. government was sentenced to that. When I went down there, I was really surprised to find that a lot of people still were in Ryan Duke's camp. Um, and a lot of this was just because they knew Bo Dukes and his family, and uh, they knew his reputation for sort of being this, uh, you know, shadowy, kind of, you know, creepy kind of guy. On the Up and Vanished podcast, Payne Lindsay was also starting to have some doubts about the official story. Ryan just woke up in the middle of the night, drives to Tara's house, drunk out of his mind, and breaks in there with a credit card and kills her with one punch and goes back? Why? What? What? That didn't make any sense to me. There was one other person listening to Up and Vanished who agreed. You know, the podcast introduced me to the case. I was asked to give some insight on some of the legal proceedings that were happening in the case, um, specifically to analyze the indictment and analyze what was going on with Bo. So he's actually going to be on trial before Ryan, which is surprising, not something that we expected. It really piqued my interest because when I read the indictment, it didn't make any sense. It said that he killed her with his hand. And it just, you know, it was, it was very vague. And so immediately that piqued my legal curiosity because I said, this isn't, this isn't possible. She was so intrigued that she eventually agreed to represent Ryan in court. When someone confesses, you usually walk in and they continue to tell you that they did it and they just want you to get the best deal possible. But to her surprise, Ryan told her that he'd lied to police about killing Tara. I definitely didn't expect that, um, but it was compelling and it was how he explained how it happened made sense. Um, I knew I had my work cut out for me though because people tend to believe confessions. With the arrest of Ryan Duke for the murder of Tara Grinstead and Bo Dukes for helping Ryan to burn her body, it appeared that the mystery of her death had finally been solved. Bo Dukes, he was charged with concealing a death and then ultimately also several charges of uh, lying to investigators. Basically, his trial was held before Ryan Duke by a couple years, two, three years, and in a neighboring county. 
Bo Duke's trial lasted about a week, and he was ultimately found guilty of concealing Tara's death and sentenced to 25 years in prison. He, I believe, is tries to play a puppet master, and he wants to pull the strings. And I believe that his apology was part of that. Um, you know, apologizing for his role, but still putting it all on Ryan. And then, the trial everyone was waiting for. The trial of Ryan Duke was held here at the Irwin County Courthouse nearly five years after his arrest and indictment for the murder of Tara Grinstead. With a confession from Ryan in their pockets, the prosecution felt confident that the person they believed to be Tara's murderer would soon face justice. The lead prosecutor for the state of Georgia was J.D. Hart. This is the picture that you'll see of Ms. Grinstead. Again, I believe the last picture that's taken of her. This is also a scene from the pageant itself. The prosecution wasted no time in highlighting Ryan Duke's statement to police. You'll have a chance to see him and make your own decision about this statement. You'll hear from him out of his own words confessing to her murder. You'll see him on video confessing to her murder. And you'll see it in his own handwriting. She really leans into the confession. You know, why would someone who is innocent confess, you know, to killing, um, you know, a beloved teacher? You know, the DNA on the glove, is that going to be yours? And he says, yes. It should be. And it is. She also leans into the forensics. You know, we they, by this point, they had uh, Ryan's DNA on the glove found outside her home. The bottom line with the glove is the primary contributor to the glove of DNA is Ryan Duke. And we've had his DNA since 05. We just didn't know whose it was. And you'll hear in this courtroom, we do know. We had a lot of challenges for physical evidence. Um, the state thought that one of their smoking guns was, was a glove. So there was a glove that was found apparently outside of Tara's home. I remember getting out, walking up to the front of the house and seeing the glove. Um, in the yard. Okay. May I approach, Judge? Sure. I'm going to show you what's the Martin State's Exhibit 44 and ask you if you recognize that. Yes. How do you recognize State 44? That's the glove from that day. On it was some DNA. They could tell it was more than one person's DNA on that glove, but they could not tell by any means what DNA was in there or even separate. Fast forward 17 years, DNA has, technology has advanced a lot, and there's something called touch DNA, where even if you just touch an object, you do leave a minute a little bit of DNA. Based on your testing of, um, or your development of a profile from the item that was submitted as a buckle swab of Ryan Duke, did you compare that to the unknown male DNA that you obtained in 2015? Uh, yes. And um, did what was the results of that? Uh, I compared it to the profile from the inner piece of the glove. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the primary profile uh, from the inner piece of the glove matched Ryan Alexander Duke uh, with a probability of it also matching one in 300 quadrillion individuals in the population. But the most damning evidence, according to the prosecution, would be Ryan Duke's own words admitting that he killed Tara Grinstead. Authorities really never released uh, the statements or the confessions that uh, the two men gave, so there was a lot of anticipation over, you know, how those would pan out. The state first called Jason Shadell, the GBI agent who interviewed Ryan Duke. And in initially, what sort of recording device did you use to record that interview? A uh, digital recorder, small black digital recorder. Okay. Uh, did Mr. Duke, that being this defendant, know that you were recording the interview with him? He did. Okay. Tell me what happened. I used to break into people's houses just to steal money. I was a drug addict. Uh, I've been drinking, I was high, I don't 
remember everything clearly. Within minutes of ta starting to talk to police, uh, Ryan Duke confesses to killing Tara Grinstead. I was stealing from a purse, and she snuck up on me, and I hit her. I didn't mean to. Purely reactionary, but and I ran. I, I mean, I didn't know what else to do. You know, and, uh, that's the only reason I didn't come forward before. Okay. I mean, I just, I can't lie, I can't live with myself. I'm so sick of this stuff. I think there's other people that feel the same way you do, too. The prosecution next alleged that Ryan Duke's confession showed what they called guilty knowledge of Tara's murder. Can you tell the jurors um, what we mean by guilty knowledge? Sure, guilty knowledge is the facts of an investigation that the only people who know of that would be the person or persons who committed the actual act because they were there at the time. One such piece of guilty knowledge was allegedly a phone call that Ryan made from a gas station near where Tara lived. So Ryan Duke goes to this uh, gas station, makes a phone call uh, to Tara Grinstead's home uh, after alleged murder when he supposedly went back to the house to clear it out of evidence and items. After you picked her up, did you ever go back again? Did you ever make any phone calls to the house or anything like that? No, sir. I mean, uh... But we know some phone calls got made to her house early Sunday. Well, that's when I called. I wanted to... I hadn't got her at that point. Okay. I called. I was hoping she was okay. How did you call? What did you do? Uh, from a pay phone. Okay. I called back the number. Okay. Another piece of guilty knowledge Ryan supposedly had was about the latex glove. In fact, have there been over the years pictures of a blue glove displayed? Yes. Um, to your knowledge, in this investigation, was the glove that was collected from Tara Grinstead's home ever blue? No. Okay. Um, so in talking to the defendant, did you ask him what color the glove was that he brought to her residence? I did. And what did he tell you, do you recall? He said it was a translucent or clear colored glove. The fact that he knew what color glove had been located at her home, is that something that you took notice of? Yes. Prosecutors, in their minds, believe this was a slam dunk case. You have a confession, it's right there for you. And what you'll hear will come down to this. Ryan Duke confessed. And at the end of the trial, when you've had time and chances to listen to that evidence, to hear from those witnesses, to physically see the evidence in this case, and to hear it out of his own mouth, the state will ask you to find the defendant guilty of murdering Tara Grinstead on October 23rd of 2005. Ryan Duke was facing life in prison for allegedly killing former Osceola High School teacher Tara Grinstead. His lawyers would have to overcome Ryan's confession and physical evidence linking him to the crime scene in order to have any chance of clearing his name. Ashley Merchant was kind of the lead in this. She's kind of the firebug in all this, uh, very aggressive, uh, in your face a lot of ways. Her husband's kind of laid back. Assisting the merchants is a local attorney, Evan Gibbs, who is also an Irwin County resident. And not only that, he knows Ryan Duke from high school, attended school with him in the same years. This case is about power and influence. The people who have it and the people who don't have it. Ryan Duke has neither. He didn't have power and he didn't have influence. Bo Duke has both. The state has both. And you're going to see that throughout the evidence in this case. A key theme of Ashley Merchant's opening statement for Ryan Duke is Ryan Duke as being the powerless kind of, you know, sidekick to Bo Dukes, who was the mastermind. Ryan Duke did not commit the crimes that he is charged with committing in Irwin County. He did not murder Miss Grinstead. He did not assault Miss Grinstead. He did not burglarize Miss Grinstead. He did not conceal her death in Irwin County. But if the jury was to find Ryan not guilty, the defense first had to undercut the physical evidence the state had against him. 
the most powerful being the latex glove. When it was found, that's a good question. I don't think anybody knows. Um, there were there were witnesses that were there that didn't see the, the glove that night. So, for example, um, Tara had a boyfriend um, at the time. He was married, but he was a police chief in another city. Okay, so you, your testimony is that you walked over that area twice. Yes, um, sir. And you don't, you can't say one way or the other whether you would have noticed it. Okay, I, 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 I did not see the glove. This is a trained detective who's literally canvassing her home um, for signs of forced entry, signs of something that happened to her, and he doesn't see the glove. To me, that means the glove wasn't there. None of these other witnesses who passed by her home, neighbors and friends, like, they didn't see it. Then all of a sudden, it's on the scene um, Monday, October 24th, when police and investigators are there. So you saw the glove twice while you were on the scene? Yes, sir. Once when you walked to the front door, and then once when you came back out onto the front porch. That was the creep. And as you told me, it stuck out like a sore thumb. Yes. It was pretty obvious. And while prosecutors allege that Ryan's DNA and prints may have been on a glove found outside Tara's home, there wasn't any physical evidence showing that Ryan had ever been inside. And none of the prints that were found in Tara's home match Ryan, correct? Correct. Right. And none of the prints from her door match Ryan? Correct. None of the prints from her car match Ryan? Correct. No DNA matches Ryan from inside the house? Correct. So not taking into account his statement, you never got any evidence that put him inside that house? No. You never got any evidence to even prove that a crime occurred inside that house? Correct. And it was that statement, Ryan's apparent confession to murder, that the defense next took aim at. So a false confession is, um, it's extremely difficult to get around because nobody believes you're going to admit to committing a crime if you did not admit to committing a crime, like if you didn't actually do it. But really what was the most important thing was analyzing the actual confession. In this interview, you primarily used what we would call leading questions, correct? Confirmatory leading, yes. Okay. And you're aware that sometimes people confess to things they didn't do. Sometimes they do, yes. This thing of guilty knowledge, that, that Ryan had divulged information during the confession that only the killer would know. And so that was guilty knowledge. That was like their slam dunk. But when you actually took the confession apart line by line, he had not. The person who was interviewing him had actually fed him most of that information. Another piece of supposed guilty knowledge Ryan had was a purse. Prosecutors alleged that he stole from Tara. And we can go through every single time that this was brought up. Um, you came back again and you asked him again and asked him if he had thought a little bit more about it. You wanted to ask him again to see if he had thought a little bit more. Correct. And at that time, he said, I probably grabbed her purse when I ran. That sounds familiar. So after you asked him six or seven times, he finally said, I probably grabbed her purse. And so all this guilty knowledge the detective actually had introduced, um, Ryan hadn't. And then there was the matter of how Ryan said he'd killed Tara. Then you, you told Ryan, you punched her, you hit her. And he responded, I don't know, that's one thing. I can't remember exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. You asked him again, could it be something other than a punch? Um, but he continued to tell you no, that it wasn't anything other than a punch, correct? Correct, several times. And you continued to ask him several times if it was possible, it was something else, if it was possible. And he continued to say no. Correct. Finally... The defense called Jerry Williams, the boyfriend of Ryan Duke's aunt, who testified seeing Ryan the night Tara allegedly disappeared. And where was Ryan when you arrived? Ryan was in the bathroom. Okay. And what state was he in? Pastor. Okay. Um, were you able to wake him at all? No. I did make sure he was breathing. This boy was passed out. I mean, I've seen him passed out before. I've done it myself. Sorry, but I have. But I've seen passed out for him. He was, he was gone. He was done. Coming up, in a surprise move, Ryan Duke takes the stand. I was driving to the courthouse from Atlanta listening to our live stream when I found out that Ryan Duke was taking the stand, and it was a complete shock. After over a week of testimony, the jury had heard from everyone except Ryan Duke. Then, in a surprise move, the defense announces that Duke will testify on his own behalf. And everybody knew this is what it comes down to. You know, what is he going to say? 
how does he get over this fact that previously he sat there with investigators and admitted to the whole crime and he got of J.D. Hart, who does not back down to anybody, that was a show everybody wanted to see. But it wouldn't be Ashley questioning Ryan. Please take your full name for the record and for the jury. Ryan Alexander Duke. Evan Gibbs put him on the stand, so he called him, which was also very important because they were friends. I started out being his lawyer. Evan started out being his high school buddy. Mr. Duke, did you murder Terry Grinstead? I did not. Did you break into her home on October 22nd or 23rd, 2005? No, sir, I did not. Have you ever been inside her home at any point in your life? No, sir, I had Evan Gibbs led him through short question after short question. He did not stray. Ryan testified that the night Tara disappeared, he had been passed out in the toilet of his trailer after doing tequila shots with Bo Dukes and a friend. Ryan said that he was still there the next morning when he was woken up by Bo. What did Bo Duke say to you when he woke you up that morning? He said he killed Tara. And what was your, I guess, what was your first reaction? I didn't know who he was talking about or what he was talking about. I was waking up out of, after being drunk, being sick. Ryan said the two of them then drove to the back of a pecan orchard owned by Bo's uncle outside of Fitzgerald. He drove down a little further and there was a clearing off the, the passenger side and he stopped. When Bo stops the truck, does he say anything to you? Yes, he said she's over there. Bo then led Ryan towards a shape covered in tree branches and other wooden debris. When you get closer, are you able to tell whether it's a person? You, you could tell it was, uh, yeah. Was, could you tell if it was a man or a woman? No, sir, not then. Was the person laying on their back or their stomach? They were laying face down. Ryan said Bo then reached down and grabbed the arm of what Ryan now recognized as the body of a woman. He reaches down, uh, he... He grabs her arm and just flips her over. Does he look at you? Yes, sir. He, he looks at me and says, I told you. After loading wood from a nearby shed into Bo Duke's truck, they both returned to the body. And <clears throat> how was Bo's demeanor at this point when you're back at the body? Yeah. He was almost excited. You know, he's cheerful. Bo then walked over to Tara's body and told Ryan to help pick her up. Did he touch the body or anything before? He did. What did he do? He, he pushes up her shirt, starts following her. Did he look at you when he did that? It was like I wasn't there. You know, I, I, I remember telling him to stop, and I remember how he looked at me. You know, it's like I'd never seen him before. After helping move her into the pine forest bordering the orchard, Bo told Ryan to help him stack wood by Tara's body. Once the wood stacked up, what, what do y'all do next? Bo tells me to help him put her on wood. And did you? <clears throat> did you help him? I did. Bo then put wood on top of Tara's body. And then what happened? He, he lit her on fire. He was very believable and very insistent on what he says happened and that his previous version was all a lie because he was scared of his former friend. Did he make any kind of threats? He implied that this place would go up like wildfire. It was kindling. And just tell me about that statement. What was the context of that? Uh, I don't know if it was before, uh, but Bo was the pyro. You know, he liked to set fires. He liked to, he would, I would come home from work and he'd be watching YouTube videos of fires. Ryan testified that over the years following Tara's death, he felt tremendous guilt for not coming forward 
and he withdrew from family and friends. He started drinking heavily and smoking pot on a daily basis and taking any kind of pain medication he could get his hands on. Did you try to commit suicide? Yes, sir, on multiple occasions. <clears throat> when was that? I think the first time was not long after I left MDI. Uh, so it had been 06, early 07. One person stuck with him through it all, Ryan's father, Fred. My brother would go buy his groceries for him. He, if he was with him, he'd sit in the truck. He would come stay with Fred on the weekends, and he told Ryan, he said, um, son, if I could fix it, I would. You know I would fix it. After his father fell deathly ill, it would be his unconditional love that finally convinced Ryan to tell the truth. At some point after you confessed to Agent Chaudel, did you change your mind about taking the blame for Ms. Grinstead's death? Yes, sir. When did you change your mind about that? I had a visit scheduled with my dad. Why did you change your mind? I couldn't lie to my father. And he promised my brother, he says, I will tell, I will tell the truth. I will tell the truth, and I will tell my part of it. And he was at peace with that when Fred died because his daddy knew. The best evidence for Ryan Duke was Ryan Duke at the trial. He came in there, told his story, and then J.D. Hart and the prosecution stands up, and they go at it. The prosecution first attacked Ryan's explanation for the call he made to Tara's house from a nearby gas station. So even though your entire purpose that morning of getting up, driving to Osceola, making the phone call, going to her neighborhood, was to return the purse, you just left it in Bo's truck. Yes, ma'am. I also wanted to... Bo had said that he had killed Tara. But you've already told the jury that you still didn't believe that, correct? I didn't believe it, but I still wanted to make sure she was okay. But you didn't go to the police for them to check to see if she was okay, correct? No, ma'am, I didn't. They try every which way to try to break him to show in some way that he could be lying right now, you know, right in front of this jury as well. I told the jury what I knew to the best of my ability, and I thought I've been as honest as I can humanly can be today. You thought you were being as honest as you humanly I, can I be? I have been as honest as I humanly can be today. But we've already talked about the fact that you don't mind lying when you feel it's necessary, correct? I can't undo the mistakes I've made. It didn't really work. Um, Ryan Duke stood his ground pretty well, and he was effective. Contrast that with Bo Dukes who was also called to the stand of that same trial. So you've got these armed guards carrying this guy in basically, you know, walking him in and he's in shackles and he's in prison garb and he's big and he's got a lawyer. Thank you, please be seated. One more second, uh, yeah, you come on down. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Duke's attorney. Tell me your name. Tracy Mullis. Thank you, Miss Mullis, I'm sorry, I knew that. Okay. Excuse me. All right, you can proceed. And the first thing I ask him is his name. Will you state your name for the record? On the advice of counsel, I'll be invoking my Fifth Amendment right not to provide testimony. You know, why are you playing the Fifth? You just see Ryan up here divulging everything, you know, all of his secrets. And then a day later, you've got Bo up there not even saying what his name is. Do you recognize that document? On the advice of counsel, I will be invoking my Fifth Amendment right not to provide testimony today. On advice of my counsel, I refuse to answer that came off as very arrogant, uh, very stubborn, um, and didn't speak at all about what he claims actually happened. After Ryan Duke told the jury what he said actually happened to Tara Grinstead, he and his lawyers could only now wait and see if the jury believed him or the prosecution. The deliberations didn't take long at all. They went in on a Friday morning for the day two of jury deliberations. And within a couple of hours, they had their decision. I remember gripping, um, just holding on, you know, for myself, for Ryan, for Evan, for John, for everybody, um, as they read the verdict. The judge sits down, has the bailiff bring over the verdict. He looks it over, hands it back, and uh, they read the verdict. State of Georgia versus Ryan Alexander Duke. We, the jury, find the defendant count one, malice murder, not guilty. Count two, 
felony murder, not guilty. Count three, felony murder, not guilty. The jury acquitted Ryan Duke of uh, five of six charges, uh, including uh, top counts of murder. They convicted him of concealing the death of another. That is the only charge he was convicted of, concealing a death, which in Georgia is uh, a 10-year max prison sentence. It was like he had been waiting for that for like 20 years, you know, to get that off of his chest, to tell what happened, to tell the truth, and for the jury to believe him. It was like the, you know, the little guy won versus the, you know, the David versus Goliath. It was like David finally struck down Goliath. But while a jury of his peers found him not guilty, in the eyes of the prosecution, the battle wasn't over. Almost as surprising as the verdict was the state's decision a few weeks later to uh, indict Ryan Duke on charges of uh, basically being an accomplice, uh, you know, to Bo Dukes. The indictment charges Ryan with concealing Tara's body in neighboring Ben Hill County, the same charge for which he's currently serving time in Irwin County. There is a legal theory that if he helped in Irwin County concealed the body and then they burned it not knowing but across the county line in another jurisdiction it's not double jeopardy he can be tried there are two different separate acts of concealing a body so that's what prosecutors went for if nothing else trying to add on some more prison time and then another surprise move a jury found Ryan Duke not guilty of all but one of the charges against him concealing the death of another. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. But according to Georgia parole guidelines, he was eligible for immediate release. Prosecutors, though, had other ideas. Under the typical parole case in Georgia, he would have been released immediately. Basically, they had said, we're not going to follow the guidelines in this case. So they were going to max him out on parole and not treat him like 99% of the inmates because of that. It's clear that they're sticking with what they think is the truth. And if it didn't work here, we're going to try it over here, we're going to do it over here. We believe it's retaliatory. We believe that it's not ethical to be doing this and to, to be trying to, to bring these charges at this point. Um, and so we're fighting it. As an investigator, as someone who's building a case and who wants to find the truth and get the right person behind bars, it's what they should have been doing. But, but they weren't. They were going with what was handed to them on a silver platter. And it's very likely that what they were handed was exactly what Bo Dukes wanted them to get. You know, they picked Ryan as, as who they wanted to try as the murderer and Bo as the accomplice. And they can't get off that train. And that means it's highly unlikely Bo Dukes will ever be charged with Tara's murder. There hasn't been any justice for Tara. I'm sure her family would feel similarly. You know, that no one is going to prison for life for her murder. That's not happening. Ryan Duke is currently serving the maximum 10-year sentence at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison in Jackson, where Ashley speaks with him every week. He feels just as guilty as if he had done it because he did not provide the family closure. And so that haunts him. So he still has that, but he does feel um, vindicated. He feels exonerated. He feels like the truth is finally out. There you have it, another audio edition of the Court TV original series, Accomplice to Murder. If you want to see more of our original series, they're available to stream for free on the Court TV website. Just check the show notes for a link. And you can see me every night on Closing Arguments with Vinnie Politan at 8 p.m. Eastern, where we dive deeper into the latest and breaking true crime stories. Thank you so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.